Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today to discuss mobility justice in the time of crisis. My name is Axel Santana. I'm an associate at PolicyLink with our California Policy and Arts and Culture Initiatives. For those of you who are unfamiliar, PolicyLink is a national research and action institute dedicated to advancing racial and economic equity in the United States. Um, next slide, please. We're based out of Oakland, California, and would like to acknowledge that we're on Ohlone tribe land, and our panelists are coming to you live from Yukat, Tongva, Kumeyaay, and Ipai tribal lands. As you all know, the current crisis caused by COVID-19 has changed life as we know it. Entire communities, businesses, and economies are being impacted while frontline and essential workers are putting their lives on the line to keep people safe, healthy, and fed. Some of the biggest changes we're feeling are restrictions on our mobility and access to places and services we depend on for a fulfilling life. Next slide. In that vein, a key but often overlooked segment of the essential worker population includes transit workers, along with many of the frontline service and food and delivery workers they help get to work every day. Many of these workers are having to choose between keeping their income and maintaining their health, which obviously isn't really much of a choice. And so today we'll be discussing the various challenges our communities are facing around mobility and transit, along with some of the potential opportunities and actions we all can take to make a difference. We'd also like to give a shout out to all the essential and frontline workers who are risking their lives to help keep us safe, healthy, and fed. Uh, some quick logistical pieces. You've all been placed on mute to minimize distractions and background noise. Um, please chat your questions or comments in the Q&A feature as well as the chat feature. Um, and feel free to do so throughout the presentations. And we'll have some time at the end uh, for more of a discussion with the panelists and with the audience members as well. And so with that, we have a great set of panelists today joining us from and representing various parts of California. Um, next slide, please. Together along with uh, several other organizations, we form a group called the California Mobility Justice Advocates, which is a BIPOC led network of organizations and individuals. And at the end of the webinar, we'll let you know how you can get involved. And so um, we have Rio Oshas um, from Rahok, who will be starting us off with a grounding exercise and giving us some historical context about how we got here. Then we'll turn to Denzel Tung from the California Immigrant Policy Center, who will ground us in some public health data and tell us how COVID, COVID is impacting our communities. And then we'll turn it over to Hannah Krieger from Green Lining Institute, who's gonna share a little bit more about the transit policy landscape at the state level and beyond. And then we'll uh, end with Vianney Rubalcaba, who's um, with the City Heights CDC, who will tell us about some local work happening in the San Diego region, as well as Leslie Martinez um, with the Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability, um, who will be sharing some challenges that uh, rural, rural communities in the Central Valley are facing at this time. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Rio. Hey everybody, um, this is Rio Oshas. I use they them their uh, pronouns. I um, just co-founded an organization called RAO, Race, Ancestors, Health, Outdoors, Knowledge, and it also means to love. Uh, I think in this time it, it's a particularly important point in history to really use our love for transformation and what that looks like. And actually the idea of, of this particular grounding was uh, from Salem, so I wanted to give a, a shout out to Salem about just kind of grounding us so that we can remember our humanity in this, right? I know a lot of us do a lot of activism work and organizing work and policy advocacy, and we also need to take a pause for kind of the grief, the mourning, and the beautiful opportunities. So what I'm gonna ask everybody to do, if you're able to and you're in a comfortable place, get your feet flat on the ground. Um, if you can, put your palms kind of up and you're just going we're going to do this for a very short time but because breath is such a huge thing and I will be talking about it as well and just kind of literally our air has been such a big thing in impact we're going to take some moments to breathe and watch our breath go in and out and we're going to do that collectively so put down anything you have and it's an invitation for you to do it so go ahead and ground your feet palms up Close your eyes if you like. And I want you to watch your breath just as natural as it is.
Want to go up your nose through the back of your throat into your lungs and then back out. Just watch it. Don't judge your breath. Just observe it. Take about two more breaths. And slowly start opening up. All right, everybody. Um, thank you for joining in that. I, I really believe that the collective breathing is going to be very crucial in this time, um, particularly because a lot of the illness that we know of as COVID-19 is attacking our respiratory system. Um, but it is a direct correlation that I will be pointing out with the kind of the bombardment that our air has faced a lot through transformation, right? I mean, through the transportation realm. So a lot of the work we're doing as transportation and mobility justice advocates is very crucial to the well-being of our earth. So I wanted to take a little bit of this time to kind of do a bird's eye view of where we're at and where and how we got to it. And again, it's a very bird's eye view and the idea for today's conversation is that we go really wide and we start kind of narrowing in. So I'm going to provide a very quick historical and global framework and how we can use that as lessons for transformation. So I will be inviting people at the end of my short session to really imagine, go beyond imagination of what a world can look like and, and how not to go back to business as usual, how to actually learn from history to present something new to ourselves. Next slide. All right, so here's a brief U.S. history of what people have often called a germ and biological warfare. So I wanted to start off with, um, I want to acknowledge that we are, uh, that I am on Songva land here out in L.A. County, and that we are in a land that by many tribes has been called Turtle Island, right? And I wanted to point out that on the left-hand side, you see an illustration of the Ottawa chief uh, of Pontiac confronting Colonel uh, Henry Bouquet around the smallpox blankets that were passed around. It is history.com, which is a very mainstream um, website, has very much counted the details of the fact that smallpox blankets were in fact used as a way, or at least were wanting to be used as a way to actually decimate a lot of the indigenous communities. And as unfortunately, we have been told that in, in our history, and throughout the Americas, there have been decimation by diseases and smallpox being one of them, right? And, and again, we are, there is a connection between that and some of the things that are ha happening right, right now with COVID-19 that I know Denzel, uh, our colleague, will be talking about next. The other piece I want to talk about is kind of our built environment and what that's been looking like. And so I wanted to pull up um, Flint, Michigan, around uh, what a lot of us became familiar with, which was the water inequities, and more specifically, the water that was basically poisoned, right, or unclean that we saw. And particularly there, we saw that African American Black and our Black relatives were really being impacted. And because of the dirty water, it had very giant impacts on people's personal health. Right, and again, I think this particular picture that you're seeing here is actually coming from Forbes.com. I have purposely used very quote unquote mainstream or government related um, sources to highlight how some of this data has already been available to us, and yet not many very not very many changes have been made. Right, and so really all of us were being asked to rise in action to really change this, right? And and one more thing I'm gonna say about a biological warfare, there's a lot I can be can be said, but I did wanna highlight, because um, our colleague Leslie Martinez on our practice round reminded me to highlight that in California, because this is a California-centric talk, we have about a million, million people throughout the state who don't have access to clean or healthy water. And, th and that is particularly decimating a lot of the undocumented communities within the Central Valley that, that we're aware of, right? So one of the things that I know is very important to highlight is how the ways in which our Black, Indigenous, undocumented 
undocumented and communities of color have been impacted and in that order as well, right? And it's really important to name that, right? That the, the, there has to be a priority for how we take care of people. Okay, next slide. The other thing I wanted to connect this with, right? So I'm connecting our health with the, with the built environment, but I also wanted to point out the ways in which we likely cause the in equilibrium in the earth that had caused COVID-19 to really take off, right? And one of the things you'll see on these charts, which, which again, just I, I got this from these charts actually came connection with what the EPA has provided. And this one is a, like the Wikipedia one, the one on the world population. And you'll see, and most of us know this, but again, it's just a reminder that the U.S. has about a 4.3% of the popu world population, yet per capita greenhouse gas emissions, the United States by far outdoes everybody else around the world of greenhouse gas emissions, right? And so to me, there is a relationship to be noticed around the cases that we are being impacted by here in the United States being one of the hardest hit, well, the hardest hit country in the world by COVID-19, right? And our greenhouse gas emissions that we've contributed to the earth, right? We know that greenhouse gas emissions has, and obviously there's many, there's a lot of information about the ways in which greenhouse gas emissions have just really decimated the earth, right? And so I just wanted to highlight that for folks so we can see the ways in which literally our advocacy work, particularly in California, we're the largest state um, in population-wise, and we have built one of the largest economies within the United States, that we really do have a large responsibility to address some of these greenhouse gas emissions, right? Because it has caused an equilibrium to the whole world, right? Which, again, unhealthy planets will breed viruses, bacteria, and diseases that will impact us as humans, right? And so we have a very big responsibility to kind of absolve that. Uh, next slide. And so, as trans and I know that it might seem esoteric, all the things that I've pointed out, but really, as transportation and mobility justice advocates, there's an important relationship to be made with all the points I, I just pointed out and laid out for us. And one of the things that I talk about that we as mobility justice do is that we're literally the arteries of every single social justice movement, right? Whether it's accessing our clinics, our schools, our jobs, our homes, like literally it's the movement of people and actually the movement of the goods, right, to get to the neighborhoods, right? And so we intersect every single uh, social justice issue out there, which is why it's important that we lift up ourselves to understand all these different intersecting um, issues that we're dealing with. And as, as most people may or may not know, uh, the total U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by economic center, and again, I pulled this up from the EPA, is that transportation happens to take a toll on the greenhouse gas emissions by almost a third, right? And again, this is where we have to rise up to figure out, well, how do we solve this issue of greenhouse gas emissions, right? And this is, again, one slice of it, right? And again, this is quoted from the EPA, is the transportation sector includes the movement of people and goods by cars, trucks, trains, ships, airplanes and other vehicles and one thing to highlight here is that that is literally the largest change we've seen in this global pandemic is the movement of people and goods right and so there's a lot to be said about what we can do to rise up to kind of really help alleviate this situation next slide and so another thing i, I want to point out in ways that we are we are going to have to commit ourselves to really look at all these intersections of of what i am really now focused on is the health our planet and our mobility justice advocacy work right like that's that's where Rauk is really going to be focusing a lot of the efforts around is also our social determinants of health which Denzel will be talking about a little bit more but again i took i picked this out from the federal office of Pro disease prevention and health promotion and when we know about social determinants of health, and you'll see, obviously as you look around this chart here, you, you can see economic stability, education, social and community context, health and healthcare. And then where it's relevant to us is the neighborhood and built environment, right? And within that, it's, our, it's the environmental conditions, the quality of housing, access to healthy foods. And these are the things that really as advocates, we, we have within our, our sphere of influence per se. 
Um, and again, I wanted to point this out because what, what we do know and what the data has shown, and this is where it's important to look at, if you have access to look at unnatural causes, is inequality making us sick? which is a four hour P, uh, PBS documentary, it really highlights the way in which the high, racial hierarchy has been dealt in a way where we will know who will be impacted the first because of the social determinants of health and the quality, right? So if we have poor neighborhoods with just discrimination, incarceration, lack of education, lack of access to food, et cetera, those communities will be prone to the most diseases. So it's not a surprise, and it's an unfortunate uh, situation that has happened again to our Black, Indigenous, undocumented, and, co and poor communities uh, through COVID-19. This is where we're going to have to address the racial justice issues that, that COVID-19 is putting up. And I do want to quote Arundhati Roy, uh, who is a writer from India who pointed out that the COVID-19 is like an MRI over our global system, highlighting places where, highlighting some of the injustices that now can come just frankly up to light, right? So I think it's important to start talking about institutional forms of racism and so forth. Uh, next slide. Um, and at this time, because of course there's a lot of things that, that are heartfelt and really difficult, right? There is definitely um, a lot of grief that's going on and there's a lot of ways in which we can send out that love and light to people. And, and to me, I, I actually believe this, that in literally imagining that world that is more just, that is more equitable, one that really prioritizes taking care of our earth and taking care of our people, our elders specifically, because it's our elders who are getting the brunt of this, it really is going to take not just our imagination that we've been taught, but an imagination that is beyond what we can see. Can we quiet our mind to share what that world will look like? Again, to quote Adam Dotti Roy, who talks about the pandemic is a portal, this portal, this time, this moment allows us to decide whether we're going to return back to the past ill or to move into a place that's filled with love and light to the benefit of the earth and the people. And so at this time, I'm gonna ask all the participants and you can chat it in. We, we, the goal of this particular webinar is to have a lively discussion and to enrich each other's knowledge. Everybody here is knowledgeable. We really want you to start chatting in some point that you are having around how the world can transform, some radical idea, something that's just filled with love. And again, in the context of, of transportation and mobility, but dream beyond it. Right, And so this is the time where we're going to ask folks to just put in the chat box something that you want to imagine. And at the end, Axel, our moderator, will be highlighting it. Um, I am available. I've left my email there, and it's going to be available at the end. But I'm just really grateful to be alongside all the panelists that, that are going to continue talking. So I will now pass it back to Axel. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for that, Rio. Yeah, great, great points there. Um, yeah, as Rio mentioned, um, please, I see some questions coming in already. Um, thanks for sharing. Um, continue to ask your questions in the Q&A chat and um, raise your hand as well. We will have some time uh, towards the end of the conversation to have a more um, interactive discussion with everyone. So um, keep the questions and chats coming. So next, we're going to pass it over to Denzel Tung um, to talk a little bit more about the public health impacts of COVID-19. Denzel. Yes, thank you, Axel. Um, and thank you, Rio, for a kind of grounding a lot of what I'm going to be talking about, um, really kind of try to approach this from a public health standpoint and, and also from an immigrant rights perspective. So again, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Denzel Tung. I'm the Health and Public Benefits a campaign coordinator with CIPC, the California Immigrant Policy Center, and I'm going to be talking with you today a bit about the impact of COVID-19 on immigrant as well as Black, Indigenous, and um, you know communities of color. Next slide, please. Uh, so just to start off uh, right here, um, I wanted to kind of provide a brief overview of what are health disparities, just knowing everyone's knowledge may be at a different place. So as you can see, health disparities, they're preventable differences and the burden of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optimal health um, that are experienced by socially disadvantaged populations. Um, and this is a, a pretty basic CDC 
uh, definition um, of health disparities. And you can see that it, you know, it can be broken out by, by a variety of different factors, um, that broken out by a variety of different factors, including education, income, uh, age, disability. Uh, on the left right here on, on the slide, which you can see is, this is pulled from a New York Times article, and it's just looking in the wake of COVID, um, some early data were able to show that basically people from wealthier areas were able to more quickly reduce their movement um, than people from poorer areas, right? And this is just an example of kind of how income, for example, um, can lead to disparities in terms of low income workers, maybe they're in more vulnerable, precarious situations. So they might still have to go to work even though they wanna socially distance and isolate. That's what folks wanna do in a pandemic, but they may not have the opportunity to work remotely that folks um, from other positions might have uh, and, and might be from wealthier areas. So that's just kind of a quick overview of um, disparity by income. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so quickly, I wanted to uh, also touch on the overall impact of COVID-19 um, in the United States. Um, this data is actually a little old because the numbers are rapidly changing each day. So I think as of now, um, it's estimated that there are over 50,000 um, deaths in the United States, unfortunately, due to COVID and about around 1 million total cases. Um, and this data is from uh, Worldometer um, and they kind of compile um, uh, data from county and local public health departments, the CDC and the WHO. Um, so that's just kind of uh, where that's coming from. And something I'll be touching on um, shortly is that a lot of the data has shown that black communities in particular uh, have been heavily hit by uh, COVID-19. Um, and I'll also be touching um, on indigenous communities as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, so first off, and, and again, I want to note that uh, today I'm, I'm focusing a lot on Black, Indigenous, um, and immigrant communities, but I want to note that COVID in general has, has also um, had a disp disparate impact um, in Hispanic and, and API communities as well, but we've really seen that, um, especially the Black community and, and to some extent um, Indigenous communities in the United States have been uh, fairly hard hit. And I, I really wanted to kind of note that today and just note that in my presentation. So when we're looking um, at disparities in the Black community, um, some preliminary data from the Centers for Disease Control show that in cases in which race and ethnicity are known, um, Black people are accounting for roughly 34% um, of confirmed cases, which is incredibly high given that um, Black Americans are only about 13% of the national population. So we can see how, uh, how much of a disparity there is right there. Um, I do want to note that major gaps in the data do exist. Um, in many cases, the race and ethnicity is missing, right? And we don't um, quite have that data. Um, some major elected officials are trying to push to get more of that data so we can kind of identify disparities and address them, but we're not uh, quite there yet. Um, I also want to note that in major cities throughout the country, um, there have been incredibly high levels of Black death. Um, and I, I, I have to note specifically, um, in Black people are accounting for over 50% of the deaths in D.C., Michigan, Louisiana, Alabama, and Georgia. So in multiple states, um, essentially Black folks are, are, are perishing at much higher rates than they are represented. Um, in the population. Um, and, and in DC, I think it was as much as about 75% of the deaths. Um, next slide, please. I also wanted to, to talk about COVID-19 briefly um, in the impact on indigenous communities um, in the States. Um, right here is a picture of Dr. Diana Hu, uh, who's a pediatrician working with the Navajo Nation um, in Arizona. Um, when we look at the data, the highest, in terms of the highest COVID-19 infection rate, the highest is New York, um, and then it's New Jersey, and then it's actually the Navajo Nation. Uh, they're number three right now, um, uh, according to some articles that I've seen. So uh, we really see that the virus is running rampant um, within this community and, and really proving to be quite devastating. And what we also know is that um, you know, the Indian health services who are supposed to kind of provide resources to um, Native American communities, it's, it's underfunded, it's under-resourced, and these communities are overburdened. And what we find in both Black and Indigenous communities is that there were already many pre-existing conditions that kind of exacerbate um, the effect of COVID-19, right? If folks are, have hypertension, 
diabetes, obesity, those issues are really comorbid with COVID-19 and kind, can kind of worsen your chances of survival should you contract it. Um, and these problems are due to overlying structural issues that existed far before the pandemic, right? Things that we still have to address, but um, you know, we should have addressed in the past, right? Through, through um, uh, policy um, and, and health policy. So just noting um, this extreme impact that we've seen. Um, you know, I was reading about, about the Navajo Nation and how they're really struggling to kind of do contact tracing and try to map out the disease and identify hotspots and they're trying their best. But because of um, the technological infrastructure isn't quite there yet all the time, folks might not always have access to cell phones um, and things like that, or even clean running water to regularly wash your hands, which has been advised by physicians. Um, it's not always a possibility. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and now I wanted to touch on um, the situation of, of immigrants in California. I wanted to focus a lot on undocumented immigrants. Um, CIPC, as some folks on the line may know, uh, along with our partners at Health Access, we have co-chaired the Health for All campaign um, for years now, which seeks to expand Medi-Cal access to undocumented immigrants who unfortunately are excluded from Medi-Cal. Um, in the state of California um, due to immigration status and also excluded from the Affordable Care Act due to their immigration status. So just to, to touch uh, briefly on, on some things that we've seen, we know that uh, undocumented immigrants in California are overrepresented um, in many fields uh, that are, are, are quite vulnerable. And that's not to say that all undocumented immigrants in these, are in these fields, but again, they're overrepresented. So for example, um, I've heard from partners in the Central Valley um, who work um, in the at work with farm workers or folks in the agricultural industry, um, how workers are struggling to get access to PPE, personal pr protective equipment. Um, and they're just concerned about their families. Um, given that they're deemed essential workers and, and, and have to work. Um, and in other areas, um, such as domestic work and, and other things like that, again, we see that undocumented immigrants, they're in these vulnerable positions, they're overrepresented and, and are quite uh, vulnerable um, to the disease. So just wanted to note that for one. Um, I also wanted to note that um, some of our partners from uh, Chirlo, which is one of our um, partner organizations and another uh, major immigrant rights organization in the state. They uh, recently did a survey of, of uh, some of their community and I believe they had a sample size of around 75 follow-up interviews where they did more in-depth interviews to, to collect information and they found um, that a lot of immigrant uh, communities, they're, they're, they're struggling with savings. They, they don't have many savings. I believe roughly a third of the folks that they surveyed didn't have access um, to healthcare, and I believe the majority were also facing reduced hours um, in response to the crisis. So we see kind of all of these compounding issues working to exacerbate an already troubling um, situation for a vulnerable um, community. Next slide, please. Now, those are a lot of the issues that we've seen, right? Like we've seen what is the impact of COVID-19 right, uh, right now on the population? So what are some recommendations? Um, I wanted to highlight two of CIPC's campaigns today and, and also happy to try to field, field questions later as I can, but wanted to highlight for one, the Health for All campaign, which I work on um, as the health policy coordinator. Um, you know, we are working right now um, to expand Medi-Cal access to undocumented immigrants to give people the vital preventative care they need, but also um, to help them, you know, access resources in the wake of COVID. Uh, Governor Newsom actually included expansion to undocumented elders 65 plus in his January budget, um, but economic forecasts have changed, right, because of this crisis and, and how we, we may go into a recession. So um, it is sort of in the air. We're really pushing the governor and pushing different legislators um, to include uh, funding for, for health for all seniors in the budget, but that's an ongoing campaign. Um, I also want to note our Cal EITC campaign, which is run by our economic justice team, which basically seeks to expand uh, the Cal EITC, which is the earned income tax credit, uh, which essentially just puts the money in the pockets of low income tax filers, um, it, it basically expanding it to I-10 filers. And folks with I-10 numbers are essentially folks who don't have a social security number, but they still work, they still pay taxes, um, but they're excluded, unfortunately from our social safety net. Um, so I wanted to highlight uh, those two campaigns as, as 
you know, kind of policy recommendations that we're putting forth um, to really address COVID-19. Um, and in our, in the call to action slide later, you can see how you can get inf more information about it. You can also feel free to email me and also uh, be on the lookout for the, the safety net for all Twitter, which is a way to kind of get involved um, with a coalition that's seeking um, to address a lot of these issues. Um, but I believe that's it. That's my time. Again, um, Denzel Tung with CIPC and happy to answer some of your questions later. Thank you, Denzel. That was great. Um, uh, audience members, please continue to chat in your thoughts and comments um, and please uh, send us your questions for the Q&A section in the Q&A feature and we'll um, get to those in the discussion portion of the webinar. Next, we're going to turn it to Hannah Krieger with the Greenlining Institute to tell us a little bit the, about the public transit policy landscape here in California. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for setting that up, Axel and Rio and Denzel. It's kind of really helped to provide that context as I transition to the high level uh, transportation and policy implications of the crisis. Um, so I'm Hanna Krieger with the Greenlining Institute. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, Greenlining is a research uh, public policy nonprofit that has been advocating for racial equity and economic justice for 27 years. And so we work across a whole variety of policy areas um, and I lead our mobility equity work, um, focusing on bringing equitable um, walking, biking, public transit um, investments to low income communities of color. And so, you know, we all know that clean, reliable transportation options, it's critical to connect folks to education and healthcare and economic opportunities, right? Um, but unfortunately, we're, you know, we're seeing that trans transit dependent and essential workers, transit workers, they don't have the privilege of working from home. And so the reality um, is that both of these groups are disproportionately low income and disproportionately people of color. And so what I wanna to share today with you all is a high level overview of the public transit policy landscape in California in light of this health and economic crisis. Um, and also highlight some potential ways for advocates and community members to weigh in on these public transit issues. Uh, so next slide, please. So I'm sure you've all seen the really uh, shocking news headlines. I mean, ridership is down really, really significantly. Some transit agencies report up to an 85 to 90% loss in ridership. And then kind of the double whammy here, in addition to a loss in fare revenue, there's a huge loss in sales tax revenue, which many transit agencies rely very heavily on. So obviously this is causing a huge financial strain on transit agencies. But you know, I just wanna be really clear that the reason that public transit is so susceptible to losses in fare revenue is not just related to COVID-19. It's really a result of decades of chronic underfunding. Um, you know, the federal and state governments have kind of neglected this essential service um, and it's forced local and regional governments to increasingly rely on these kind of you know, precarious funding sources like fares and tax, sales tax measures. And so in an equitable world, local governments should not have to pass off operating costs onto transit riders and to everyday citizens. And so I think this is just really highlighting that this is a wake up call for federal and state governments to step up to fund public transit service at levels that actually keep it um, resilient in the face of crises like this. Um, and then just regarding the public health and transit kind of intersection, I want to mention that about, I think as of last week, 100 transit workers in the US had died of COVID-19. And so this is a tragedy and we are clearly not doing enough to support our frontline workers who are heroes and who are helping essential workers to get to their jobs to keep us safe and healthy and well fed. Um, now there have been some initial responses by transit agencies to protect driver and passenger health, um, but these responses are not necessarily standard across California or the country. There's not enough resources to do so. And so we have to do a lot more coordination and support for public transit more broadly. Next slide, please. So the good news is that there is some temporary relief uh, with the federal stimulus package allocating $25 billion for public transit operations. And um, these funds will you know, assist with the lost fare revenue. They will help to sustain transit jobs. 
and they will support the increased cleaning and sanitation costs. Next slide, please. So the $25 billion in federal funds is being distributed to metropolitan planning organizations around the country who will then decide how these funds are spent and then distributed to individual transit agencies. But one thing I want to note here is like, that's great, but the advocacy can't stop here. Um, it's really important to hold decision makers at all levels accountable to distributing these funds in a way that's equitable and that protects the health of frontline workers. And so to provide an example, in the Bay Area, $1.3 billion was allocated to MTC, which is our Metropolitan Planning Organization. And so in terms of how this $1.3 billion will be spent, MTC staff gave some initial recommendations that were honestly just very unsatisfying and inequitable in a couple of different ways. So first, it basically failed to incorporate any specific COVID-19 or public health measures. And then second, their allocation formula is very inequitable because it favors high fare transit agencies such as BART compared to um, transit agencies that are primarily buses. And so here, I really wanna uplift the quick action and amazing leadership of a Bay Area coalition that's made up of a, of a variety of transportation advocates and a transit labor union who put together a letter requesting that MTC allocate 5% of the $1.3 billion for a COVID-19 response fund. That would equate to about $40 million. And in this fund, provide protective gear for all transit workers and riders who need them, um, as well as disinfecting all transit vehicles, provide hazard pay for transit workers, uh, supplement the recovery of lost fares for transit agencies, uh, meet the needs of especially vulnerable populations, including people with disabilities, uh, seniors, and paratransit riders. And then lastly, provide emergency funds to various transportation agencies on the basis of need, so to make that distribution more equitable. And so what's here that I wanna highlight is that you know, we have to hold our metropolitan planning organizations accountable to how they're going to spend that federal stimulus dollars during this crisis. And you know, it's something that advocates around California and the country um, should take part in. Because it's you know, really about, it's building solidarity between transit workers and transit dependent riders during this crisis. Uh, next slide, please. So now I kind of want to transition into how this health and economic crisis is impacting this year's legislative session in California. So only a few months ago, it seems like so long ago now, this was gearing up to be a very exciting year for public transit and for transit riders. We had bills for free transit for all California youth, students, and seniors. There were a number of bills to increase local public transit funding and efficiency. However, you know, this health and economic crisis has pretty much put a pause on these efforts for the year. Um, you know, despite efforts to make the case that affordable, efficient transit will be needed now more than ever during the long recovery, but unfortunately, um, this year, California state senators and assembly members will only be allowed to carry forward bills that have a specific tie to COVID-19 relief and recovery. Next slide, please. So there's obviously gonna be a huge impact on the budget. There will be an estimated 10 to 15 billion shortfall uh, in the budget due to a loss of uh, income tax. But the good news is that this year, California did have a record $17 billion budget surplus. So that will help to kind of um, cushion that impact. We do have cash reserves going into this economic downturn. And it is estimated that a, around seven to $10 billion will be allocated for COVID-19 in California. And so in May, the California budget is revised to kind of meet the current economic forecast. But what this means is that there's still an opportunity for advocates to submit public comments and letters on a variety of issues. Because, you know, despite this budget shortfall, we all know as transportation advocates um, that a fully functioning transportation system is critical for access to healthcare, education, uh, economic opportunities, 
And so we have to advocate for increased access to transit and other mobility options to be a critical component of our recovery. Next slide, please. So some of you actually may have signed on to this budget letter uh, to the governor that was spearheaded by transform and climate plan. And so even though the free transit bills are on hold for this year, this is still an opportunity to highlight the need for free transit policies, both in the short term and in the long term. And so I'll just summarize the main points of the letter. So in terms of the immediate needs, Prioritize emergency transit funding by reallocating funds from capital projects to instead keep transit operations running uh, in a way that protects the health of transit riders and drivers. Um, next is to, with those funds, uh, implement immediate fare free service. So we have this increased flow of emergency transit dollars and we're calling for these funds to be targeted towards waiving fares. Um, this is a twofold effort to both help essential frontline workers get to their jobs and to reduce close contact between riders and drivers. And then in the long term, these were the recommendations on how to propel California's recovery efforts from COVID-19. First, to support permanent free transit passes for vulnerable riders in the long term. And again, using those funding sources listed above um, from you know, capital projects. Uh, to then formally establish fare-free transit passes for youth, college students, and seniors. And so we see this as a very critical approach and part of the recovery package to help vulnerable populations get back to school, jobs, and healthcare. And then the last recommendation is to establish a California universal transit pass. So in a statewide transit pass system, all of the fares of transit riders would be collected into one single revenue pot. And so this universal system, it would be more easy uh, to allow vulnerable populations to receive uh, discounted or free fares. And so it could kind of actually work uh, like the Bay Area's Clipper card or LA Metro's TAP card. So it's basically a reloadable fare card that's attached to a person's identity and it's uh, capable of then providing flexible payment options and then fare caps depending on your income. And so I mentioned these because these are some pretty bold, creative, innovative ideas, um, but that's exactly the kind of ingenuity that we're really gonna need to help lead us out of this crisis. And so that summarizes my piece of the presentation. I hope that helped to provide some context on the current policy and budget landscape on what's happening at the state level regarding public transit um, and kind of highlight some actions that advocates are taking um, and kind of shed light on how this may impact your regional or local public transit agency. Um, and I'm happy to connect offline with folks if you're interested. So thanks so much. Thanks, Hannah. Super helpful background um, on the policy landscape there. So next, we're going to pass it over to Vianney Ruvalcaba um, from City Heights CDC, who's going to tell us a little bit about some of the great work happening uh, down in the San Diego region. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Vianney Ruvalcaba. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm a transportation and planning coordinator at the City Heights Community Development Corporation here in San Diego. And yeah, I just want to take time again to appreciate um, the previous speakers and all the context that they provided. It's definitely exciting to see this momentum for um, no cost transit as a, as a recovery method. Um, so I really appreciate that. So uh, next slide, please. Um, today, I kind of want to talk about um, some of the on the ground work that we've been doing here at City Heights CDC. So our mission is to enhance the quality of life of people who live and work in City Heights. Our organization does that through developing and managing affordable housing. We have resident services like a food pantry, economic development programs, uh, including small business help and things like that. Um, and here at the transportation and planning program, we advance that mission through transportation justice advocacy and built environment improvements at the neighborhood level along with residents. Uh, we also work on regional mass transit improvements like frequency enhancements, late night service, and no cost transit. We were very involved with MTSs, uh, which is our transit operator, their Elevate SD ballot measure um, effort throughout um, 2020. 
and the, through the San Diego Transportation Equity Working Group, which is a coalition of environmental justice organizations here in San Diego, and through our work with the community-based outreach working group uh, in SANDAG to try to uh, influence and advocate through the regional transportation plan effort. So recently, our organization had a shift um, in our priorities and our resources in light of COVID-19. A lot of our staff time and our program uh, has been reallocated to rental assistance casework. Uh, Julio Garcia is our organizer for transportation, but um, he had to shift some of his time to help people stay in their homes uh, in City Heights and throughout San Diego. And the question now and the question that our team dealt with before COVID is how do we protect vulnerable populations how do we protect workers and bus drivers uh, through housing and transportation solutions? So this slide kind of, it's a screenshot from MTS's website. Um, this is their response in early April to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, they enacted a rear door boarding policy on all buses after or our organization co-led a call to action with other EJ organizations. Uh, and the bus driver union to call for this policy in an immediate fare suspension uh, due to COVID-19. But here we can see that riders were still urged to purchase their day and monthly passes. And uh, the agency indicated that they may still be subject to visual inspection by drivers as they board through the rear door. So there's still some confusion about enforcement that a lot of advocates are worried about. And it's definitely encouraging to see that statewide agencies are thinking of no cost transit as a long-term uh, relief policy for, for, this, um, for this crisis. Um, so again, a consideration that we have is how do we fund transit agencies? We can't rely on vulnerable populations and low-income folks to continue uh, to fund a public service. This should be a quality public service uh, and people should not have to continue to pay into it and continue to be taxed in order to use it. So we, we are really interested in initiatives like the Youth Opportunity Pass, which we worked on with Mid-City Can, another local uh, organization working to achieve transportation justice in San Diego. Uh, we were kind of keeping track of those state agencies to provide uh, statewide youth opportunity passes and college level youth opportunity passes, but we'll definitely continue that. And then um, we're also very interested in the universal uh, transit paths that we heard uh, from Hannah earlier today. Uh, next slide, please. So I kind of want to move into um, another challenge that we're encountering at this time is how do we ensure that all voices are heard in online public meetings? Uh, so how do we facilitate simultaneous interpretation in different languages, multiple device access, etc.? So this screenshot is from the last uh, Built Environment Team resident meeting, which is a group of um, resident transportation justice advocates in City Heights that our organization facilitates every month. So this group of people has been meeting in person for the past eight years. And this month, um, we had our first like digital engagement meeting. So um, our, our, our stay at home meeting. And we needed simultaneous interpretation um, for one of our resident leaders who has been involved in uh, really like landmark campaigns like um, bikeway construction and um, enhanced transit access etc so we had to have her um, son like help her out set up the zoom call in his laptop and then i had to set up a conference call between her and the interpreter so the two people that you see on the phone were going through simultaneous interpretation while the meeting was going on so it was definitely a challenge at first to make it happen but Again, this kind of shows the resiliency and the strength that our community leaders have to just make it happen uh, and keep going. But then um, a question is that how do public agencies make this happen? So us as a community-based organization, we really found a way to make our community meeting accessible to our residents. But different agencies deal with public comments differently. So live comments are kind of rare right now. Written comments are often read, and sometimes folks cannot talk. Sometimes folks can talk via Zoom or the phone, um, but a lot of times they cannot. And we still, for example, don't know will be live comments available during our evening uh, budget hearing for a city budget upcoming uh, this Thursday. So one of the questions that we're dealing here um, at City Heights CDC is how do we ensure that residents remain involved in the planning process? 
During this meeting, our residents and our staff identified new mobility priorities, um, including a focus on fare suspension, rear door boarding, lowering speed limits, um, widening sidewalk space, traffic calming signage, and complete streets infrastructure as um, things that can kind of make uh, living our lives safer during COVID. But one of the important concerns that our residents have is how do we avoid violent enforcement and citations uh, for pedestrians and cyclists, especially in environmental justice communities. So this is something that um, definitely came up. Um, we want to avoid violent enforcement and fines that could keep folks from paying their rent or their food for the month. Um, so that's kind of something um, that we're looking at as cities and agencies enact policies designed to protect us, including open streets policies and face mask policies. Next slide, please. So this is a, a very like difficult photo to see. It's a photo of a, a black man being pulled out of a bus by transit police in Philadelphia for not wearing a mask. So the news article that I took this from uh, says that the agency has since changed their policy um, and that, that they're not doing this anymore, but only after this photo became viral. So what we don't want is to put our communities uh, at risk and to put them through this stress at this time. There's already a disproportionate policing of Black, Indigenous, and people of color and low-income people, especially folks who are in transit and folks who are unsheltered, right? So we need to make sure that these public health policies don't lead to even more biased and violent uh, policing. So uh, next slide. And I kind of want to end it in a positive note. Um, we talked about violent policing and some of the concerns uh, with transit. But um, so this is, again, another photo of the built environment team. And they really are my heroes as a transportation planner. I've learned so much from them, and I'm so grateful for their strength and their love for their community. So these folks, their parents, their grandparents, their young professionals, and all they're trying to do and have been trying to do is to make streets safer for their families and for their neighbors. And I think it's just so amazing. Um, and we're trying to figure this out together. Um, how to make the, the planning process more accessible is a key focus of our program. Um, here is an image of Esperanza giving a public comment at her community planning group um, related to complete streets in a deadly corridor that is El Cajon Boulevard. Uh, and then here's a photo of resident leaders at the new, uh, the first um, inline uh, freeway uh, transit station on the SR15. Uh, there's a bus rapid transit station at the freeway level. It's the first in our region. And um, yeah, I just can't wait to, to have dinner with them and to hug them again and be able to work on these campaigns in person. But in the meantime, um, organizations like ours are working on keeping them in the loop and um, having them remain ownership of their neighborhoods. So again, I'll be uh, available to answer any questions if you want to hear more about um, how MTS is dealing with, with transit enforcement and some of the solutions that we've found on how to conduct resident engagement. So thank you. Thank you, Vianne. Such inspiring work happening down there. Um, and so now we're gonna turn to the Central Valley and um, hear from Leslie, who's gonna tell us a little bit about what's happening in um, the rural context in California. Hi everyone, my name is Leslie Martinez. I am a policy advocate with Leadership Council for Justice Accountability. Uh, we are a nonprofit based in the San Joaquin Valley, but we also do work in the East Coachella Valley, mainly focusing our work around um, access to opportunity for rural communities. Um, so today I'm gonna tell a story about um, uh, Cantua Creek and a program that they themselves decided to really like, um, they saw that they're, they're a very hardworking community. So they are um, based on the west side of Fresno County. Um, they are in the Westlands Water District. For those of you, us who are from the San, for those of y'all who are from the San Joaquin Valley, Westlands Water District is probably one of the most powerful ag players in like big ag. Like if you've never, if you don't know what big ag looks like, you just have to take a trip um, to Cantua because around them, they are completely surrounded around almonds. They're completely, they, are surrounded between almost all of the produce that comes out of Fresno County um, is around them. And additionally, Cantua and El Porvenir, both communities probably, um, somebody in, in that community may have picked the food 
um, that is on your table today. Um, and definitely appreciating our essential workers and our farm workers um, for all the hard work that they do. Kentua Creek has a really long history of advocacy. Um, we've been working with them as leadership council since for about six years now um, around water issues as because they're in Westlands Water District and there's a huge ag around them, they have contaminated water and ex crazy expensive water bills due to that. So their water bills are averaging two to three hundred dollars a month. Um, and they are provided drinking water, but you know, it's still a huge issue. But another issue is that this is one of the most isolated and, uh, and disadvantaged communities we work with. Um, they're unincorporated, so they don't really have anybody that they don't have a city council member. Um, they have to go through a, uh, they have to go through their supervisor, and supervisors um, have about they can have from they can have anywhere from four to four to like ten com unincorporated communities in their district, um, and they aren't always the most responsive. Um, however, knowing that this group of these, this group of women who you see photographed um, decided that they were so isolated, they were far from grocery stores. Cantu is just a couple 130-ish homes with a school and a liquor store, um, but they needed more than that. They needed to access healthcare. They needed to access all these other things. Um, so there was one woman who had a driver's license. And she had a van, so people would ask her. She was, a, she was a trusted leader in the community, and I'll talk more about her later. Her name's Julia Mendoza, and Julia decided was talking to um, to us about how the how gas is just getting so expensive, and like she doesn't feel comfortable charging people all this whole thing. So, long story short, we applied for a grant, and that grant. Uh, was able to get them the Tesla that you see photographed here. And now they have like seven charges in their community, three bolts and a Tesla, and they have their own ride share and it's controlled through a third party organization um, that kind of manages it. And they have their own way of doing things. They give each other rides and it's been going on for about three years now. Um, can we go to the next slide? So I what I want to tell in the story is how this, this story of really amazing community power, community-driven transportation, um, how it was impacted by COVID and the lack of, in, of having this form of transportation being institutionalized by Fresno County um, has resulted in what rural transport, transportation looks like right now. Uh, so COVID-19 in Fresno County, uh, we, it is a bit of a hot mess, but there are about 75% of cases that we know are people of color um, and and that is that thing that we know because we know there are a huge lack of testing opportunities here. For example, there's not a lot of rural places where folks can get tested. Um, it's typically in the more metro urban areas. Um, and we are under the, we're for a region about our size. We're supposed to be doing about 1,500 tests a week, and right now we are maybe getting to 150. So there is a huge amount of folks that are not being that are not you know they're not getting that information. Um, and one of those, and one of those big reasons why is because folks have no idea what's happening. Um, a lot of the information that is currently being is out there on COVID is through the county website, the county Twitter, um, and places like Gandua Creek don't have any type of broadband infrastructure. Um, that that means that like you literally you cannot have Wi-Fi at home. Um, they have unreliable cell service to this day. Um, and the communities that do have maybe some type of um, infrastructure or connection to broadband have actually no real way of get, buying into that system because they can't afford it. Um, and because of this huge lack of information, it is really the, the burden of telling folks like what the symptoms are, how to get tested has really been shifted to a lot of uh, the community leaders in the community. Um, so what, so if folks need anything, they just call, you know, Isabel from Lanier, Jovita from Tombstone, and that's the way that information has been getting around in the county, that or Univision. Um, so it's been really difficult for a lot of folks to kind of understand exactly what steps Fresno County is taking, what help is out there, and how it will affect um, their, you know, how it's going to affect their everyday lives, because they're essential employees. Um, when I, when I, before I did this, uh, webinar, I actually called Julia and I told her, and I was like, hey, what do you want me to say? Like, this is a good platform. And Julia's like, we can't afford to stop working and no one is giving us the resources. So we just need help. Like, we want someone to know that we are here and that, like, our community is not getting enough, in like, we don't have basic infrastructure, we don't have clean water, and 
now and like we don't have transportation to get anywhere now um and and i'll and so if we could go to the next slide and so when julia told me she's like what i was like what do you mean you don't have any transportation she's like we're too scared to drive like me and the rest of the Raiteras are too scared to get in cars like we don't have sanitation there's no um they didn't give us masks like i'm too scared i have my father at home and doña lola's elderly like all of these issues were coming up and i wanted to i think um i really want to show you all like what it means like to live in a community where you really don't have any type of uh transit to get to like the most essential places that you need to be and so like the nearest hospital to Ganzua is a uh, community regional which is located in downtown fresno um, and it's 52 minutes away uh so no walking um, I mean, and even if they could walk there, there's no, there's no sidewalks, there's no bike lanes, you know, it's, you could get hit by a tractor if you were to walk down the street. Um, this, and the same thing for the nearest affordable grocery store is about still 30 minutes away into the next bigger city uh, called Kerman, uh, that's also located, and it would be a Walmart. That, that was probably, that would probably be folks' as best bet. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? And so, and then on top of this, we hear, I, you know, I'm continuing to talk about Gansua as this like strong, resilient farm working community. Um, and people, I, I, sometimes I hear, well, if, if folks are picking the fruit, why don't they eat it too? Um, well, that's because we, they don't have the funds to do it. Um, I think a lot of folks don't realize that when, um, when a farm worker can't go working in the field, if it's rainy, uh, that is like, that it, but when you don't go to work, you do not get paid. Um, and because of everything that's happening with COVID, I'm sure everyone knows that a lot of, uh, because of restaurants not ordering produce, there has been rotting vegetables um, that are rotting right next to communities um, because they don't have the labor to pay, they don't have the money to pay for the labor. Um, so folks have been relying on food banks a lot more than they ever have. Uh, La Señora Isabel, who runs the Lanier Food Distribution, that is one of the only food distributions on West Side, in West Side Fresno County, you can't see it here. Um, but that one, um, she typically serves around 100 families um, every month. And over the last two food distributions, she has served 350 families per food distribution. Um, her reserve is gone. Um, and in Kantua, if you look, Kantua is a little red dot. And if, and if you see, those are the food distributions that are closest to Kantua Creek. I know that Three Rocks looks really close, but it is an extremely, extremely like quite a long distance with a very big hill and Gantua Creek folks there are retired there are some families but a lot of the folks are actually retired farm workers who are deathly afraid of leaving their house because they're scared of getting any type of infection they're scared of um, they also can't walk that far we all know farm workers farm workers are it's, it's the hardest work out there and um, they're not able to get to the food distribution so and Julia's, you know, like trying her best, but the food distribution also has very strict rules as to who can pick up and who can't pick up the food. Um, and can we go to the next slide? And there's no one. And so there's like some of the takeaways that I, like, I, like this is a, this is the reality in Gandua Creek, right? Um, we They have these cars that are parked and just being charged there. Um, and I, I, a lot of people will, why, you know, why doesn't anyone else step up? I think in a community like Gandua that is so small and so tight knit, it's one. Of, it, they really are doing the best that they can to shelter in place because they see it as a. That's their home. Um, like that. That is. If if you've been to as for those, of, I don't know if anyone ever has been to a small community in the San Joaquin Valley, but it's like a pueblo. Like el pueblo unido really means that they've got each other's backs and they're also going to hold each other accountable. So like Julia talked about, like, you know, she's driven down and told people go inside. So, um, you know, this is this is what it's like. And so some of the issues that we've seen is like, there's an incredible need for just basic rural transportation. Anytime as advocates, we're asking we're, for more types of it, for uh, any type of basically public transportation, you will fare box. Like, uh, you know, like no one's gonna ride it. There's not enough people there. Um, so no, okay? So what happens if you don't have a car? You know, like you really can't go anywhere. Um, you have to rely on these like informal, like ride, sh uh, ride shares. Um, and, and you know, and I think that brings up a really good point of ensuring that like 
not every transportation service is going to work for every single community. Like rural, rural California, just because we are sprawled and spread out everywhere does not mean that everyone has access to a car. It means that we need creative solutions and community-based approaches to transportation. Like com it needs to come from community residents. Like what works great for you? How, what is affordable for you? Um, and just, and I think this, one of the, for me as an advocate and somebody, I'm very close to like Gensua Creek. I, I've been working there for about two years now. And I, I just, when I talk to them about their needs for rural transportation, but then I talk to the other communities I work with and they're like, well, actually, like, I'm, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't know how to get to dialysis because like they they cut the routes in my community. Um, so like, I don't know what to do. And in reality, Cantua Creek is probably about the best scenario that we have in the entire, and, and I'll speak for Fresno County, just because I work directly in Fresno County, but it might be the, it, it, it's the best scenario right now for folks, because at least maybe they can ask Julia, maybe Julia can really, find, you know, if it's an emergency, she can go and drive somebody if they needed to. Um, and the fact that it's not an institutionalized service, and by that I mean, like, it's not, the county has no role in how it's run. It's run by, a, you know, a third party, uh, you know, on a, a, it's a company, they need profit. So they're, you know, the information, we didn't really know what was happening for a long time. Julia didn't have access to PPE. And the reason why that's so important is because it, when you live in rural community, you're not, going to the store is not something that you can continue to do. For example, like some of us would be able to like walk down, you know, or go to the Target to check to see if they had like sanitation or masks or you know whatever that may be but in a, a rural community that is much harder to do because it's about a it's about a 40 you know it's a 30 minute drive to get there um and there's no backup you know transit like so if you don't have the stuff like if you don't find it on that first visit you can't go back for maybe you know one to two weeks depending on what it looks like and what, and back to this, like, and when it, since it's not institutionalized and it's run by a company, like, what is the future? Like, we could, we, we're talking about in the now, but post COVID, what does recovery look like? Is, is this company going to prioritize the future of Lonnie Bannon? Is it going to continue to be the like literal lifeline for the community to move into the goods around them? Um, and, and we don't know that, right? Like we, we don't know if that's gonna be a priority for the company. And I think overall that one of the biggest takeaways that I, I've, from this, from this and a lot of the other work that Leadership Council has been doing, I know that VNA uh, was talking about like lack of public participation. We cannot, we cannot even get our, the Board of Supervisors to read anything out loud at meetings. They're making important decisions. They are not hearing from their, constituents uh, constituents have been have been asking since the beginning of this whole crazy shelter in place like we need a rental moratorium and there was like 20 comments submitted last week and nothing that they the, the board didn't even address it um, and we're continuing to figure out like how are we going to get the county to listen to us I mean if they didn't listen to us before like how do we do it now and and that scares a lot of community residents um, and I think that considering that um, this digital divide that VNA also beautifully talked about, um, and you know, I touched a little bit upon here, it just I think that just the biggest thing is the free market is failing community. It's like really hurting everything that small rural communities rely on. We they are not safe in their homes. They don't have any way of getting around. Uh, and, and I think that's something that we really need to start thinking about when um, when Rio was talking about like thinking about the world without like like very imagined like we can make this real. And when we want to make it real, it has to be focused with our BIPOC folks at the front and also making the changes and getting rid of this idea that the free market is going to solve all our problems because people are dying in communities and people are being poisoned and there's nowhere where they can get information to figure out how to get around that. Um, so that's dark, but to lighten it up, Julia's doing great. She is still 
um, delivering food to a lot of community uh, uh, community uh, residents and um, we're working with them. We're not going to stop fighting and you know we really hope that you all too are continuing to fight for communities um, that you work with and if and um, we hope that you also help elevate the stories of the San Joaquin Valley and the East Coachella Valley that are also like very underreported and have tremendous need as well in terms of uh, mobility. So um, looking forward to working with all of you and I'll be around for questions as well. Thank you, Leslie, and all um, of our panelists. Super important points to be um, having a conversation around. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So while folks are um, chatting in their questions and raising their hands and getting ready for the discussion part of the um, webinar, I just want to thank everyone for joining um, and also um, hearing from our panelists about all the work that you're doing um, to alleviate some of the challenges that our uh, communities are facing in this time. And so I just want to wrap up the presentations by sharing with the audience that PolicyLink has just drafted and released a series of briefs that lay out key data points and strategies for an equitable recovery. Um, you can find these on our website and we'll share the link along with the recording of this webinar. Um, but just to quickly go through them, um, they include center, centering racial equity by collecting and using disaggregated data, um, planning for the most vulnerable and implementing race conscious approaches. Um, we also want to put people first by supporting essential frontline workers, guaranteeing incomes and freezing costs and protecting people from losses, um, as well as prioritizing people over corporations, as has been a thread um, in this conversation. We also want to um, invest in community infrastructure, which means fortifying community-based organizations, providing financial support for state and local governments, um, and investing in physical infrastructure in high-need communities as well as building an equitable economy by ensuring economic security during the crisis, using stimulus funds to build the next economy and forging a new social contract that enables shared prosperity. And lastly, we think it's important to protect and expand community voice and power um, by centering community voice and policymaking and spending, uh, protecting the right to vote and increase access to the ballot box. And lastly, removing barriers to organizing and including labor unions in pandemic response planning. Um, so those are just some principles that PolicyLink has put together um, and drafted, and we're happy to share that um, with this group after the webinar. And so while folks are um, chatting in their questions, um, if the speakers could put back their um, videos on, and then uh, if you could go to the next slide quickly. I'm going to read a couple of questions that were asked throughout the conversation um, and have the panelists um, share their thoughts. But in the meantime, uh, we want folks to also be interactive in this discussion. Um, as we've seen, some of you all have been chatting in the chat. Thanks for that, uh, making this interactive. Um, but we also want to hear from you all, like what are some of the challenges related to mobility um, that you're facing in your community at the moment? And then also what are some things you or your organization or community are working on locally at the state level that you'd like this audience to know about, um, whether it's any way we can support you um, or get involved. Um, so for the questions, we got a couple, um, one from Craig about the social determinants of health slide. I think this was when Rio was presenting. Um, he asked, where does the food security and quality come in, um, in that little graphic? Rio, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, th those are really great questions. And actually, I pulled up the that social determinants of health specifically from the EPA. I'm, I'm sorry, from the Office of Prevention and Disease. I quite quite can't remember it. Uh, but if you pull it up, you'll actually see it. And I just highlighted some of those specifically. But under the neighborhood and built environment, that's where we're really speaking about access to healthy food, right? And I and I think that's a very important statement to make. Because as uh, Leslie even pointed out, that sometimes what's qualifying as food is liquor stores, right? Which is actually not healthy food and is like detrimental to our health, right? And again, to me, that is a direct connection in relation to what I talked about as a biological warfare, right? Like it is literally a biological warfare to feed food that is very well scientifically proven that it's unhealthy, 
causes a lot of diseases and have that only be accessible, right? Like that is, those are forms of institutional racism and those are forms that keep our communities down. Thanks for that, Rio. Um, another question we have is uh, from Christopher and he's asking, some writers have expressed hesitation from using transit in the future due to the health and safety concerns. Um, what can transit agencies and advocates do to ensure riders continue trust in transit? I feel like Hannah said a little bit about this in her presentation. I don't know if you want to emphasize or say anything else about that. Yeah, I would just emphasize that we have to provide more funding and resources for this um, to give folks the kind of confidence and security that public transit will be a healthy um, option for them in the future. And, you know, there is, we kind of are running the risk of, is this crisis going to kind of scare people away from public transit and get people back into their cars? Um, and while these fears are valid, so is the threat of climate disaster and transportation related pollution and increasing poverty. So there's never been a better time to fully fund public transportation at the level that we need in a safe way. And can I add to that? If I yes, could? please. I also, I also think that, like, how does anyone win trust back? Like, you win trust back by engaging community. Like, this is a moment for also transit agencies for a very long time have been able to operate in ways where they don't have to really be held accountable. It's hard to keep trans these huge transit agencies accountable. And like, now is the time to be like, what are you going to do? Like, work with us. Like, together, let's work on a plan post COVID. Like, let's have disaster plans for public transportation where the community is able to actually weigh in on that, right? And I think that like couples in with what Hannah's saying is like, yeah, give them money and also give them money to work with like community residents. So that that transparency, that's building relationships and that's allowing residents to have the own tool to like stand up to these giant agencies that, you know, can have all the, like have all this power and like engaging residents, period. <laughs> yeah, and I just want to act think, oh, go oh. ahead. No, I just wanted to echo what both of you, uh, Leslie and Hannah just said, because I think what's interesting is that for a very long time, we actually, we see that greenhouse gas emissions or the climate impact has actually, there has been a pandemic that's been already happening, right? It's just that it's maybe more slowly felt, but we have so many deaths that are actually related to people being impacted by their respiratory systems, right? And so this has already been proven. So Han, I think great point that you said, it's kind of ridiculous to, to be like, oh yeah, let's get everybody back in cars, because cars is what got us in this problem in the first part, right? Like I really do believe that the breathing disease is related to the harsh air that our earth is also experiencing. And then let's see, yeah, great point. It's like rebuild trust by making it accessible and safe. Like the money is there. It's ridiculous that we act like it's not there. Did you want to respond to that, Hannah? I just wanted to build on Leslie's point, like in terms of asking the community what they need. If they say they need free transit to um, you know, incentivize them to ride transit again, then give them that and find the funds for it. Um, if we're serious about building up transit ridership again, then we're going to have to be very creative and innovative. Thank you for your thoughts, everyone. Um, we have a question from Cindy. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts around this, but um, are there anything, any California transit agencies um, distributing or offering masks to riders who don't have them, um, in particular, any ADA passengers? I'm not sure if anyone has heard anything about this. Yeah, not that I've seen, Cindy. Um, I don't. I think you're calling in from Seattle. I wonder if um, you have any thoughts around what's happening up there. Uh, feel free to chat us or raise your hand if you'd like to talk. Um, I think this question is for VNA. Uh, what actions or policies has NCTD in San Diego County undertaken? Hi, I'm not super familiar with NCTD. That's the North County Transit District. Our organization mostly does work with MTS. They're the Metropolitan Transit System and they're based in Central and South San Diego. So unfortunately, I'm not familiar, but if I can get this person's contact info, we can find a way to find out. 
cool. And that was from Craig Jones. Craig, if you want to oh, leave something Craig. in the chat. Yeah, I, I, I know Craig from uh, our Sandag working group, which is a really cool um, public working group that our MPO has that kind of brings community-based organizations to the table. And I can see that he shared some of the stuff that we're doing related to the five big moves. Um, something we're really excited about as we think about long-term transportation planning. Great. Um, and I think these are both for Leslie, um, from Ray, and from Candace. The first one is, uh, since Walmart is not always healthy, how far is the nearest healthy or affordable grocery store? Um, wow. I mean, oof. That would probably be in if we're if they if folks assuming folks are staying in Fresno County and would like you know um, it would probably be in Fresno. Could, I know a lot of community residents do, um, especially the señoras that I work with. Uh, they do these like monthly Saturday morning Costco trips, um, and they sometimes they even like will go and ask their neighbors like, "I'm going to Costco. Like, what does everyone need?" Um, and then when they go to Costco, they're able to get right next to it. Um, there's like a food map that I know they, they go to quite a bit. Thank you. And then um, the other question for you is um, from Candace. I'm curious who the third party rideshare company is for the Cantua Creek project. Is it Green Commuter? It is Green Commuter. And we, we worked with them in the past and they're, you know, I think they're trying their best, but I think this is just another example of what happens when like when like they're not they're based out of LA you know so like things are a little bit difficult and um when the and because they're not like a giant or you know they're not Fresno Cog like they didn't have any backup you know sanitation or masks um so like I like Julia had to go and like find some sanitation for her car for the car that she drove for about the first couple weeks mm. Um, this is sort of a follow-up question. It looks like for you, Leslie, are there any farmer's markets accessible to provide healthy food? No, there are not. Um, we've been working for a really long time to actually get a community garden because um, there's so many retired farm workers and like, you should see the gardens in Cantua. They're elaborate. And a lot of folks grow some food, but they're very small. You know, they're not like huge gardens. And there's actually this old um, firehouse that is abandoned in the community. And that's where the chargers are. And we're trying to take, we're trying to basically like take the whole thing, but it's perfectly set up for a community garden. And we've been working on it with community residents. Um, and that would probably be the closest farmer's market accessible. And that's just like a normal problem in the entire San Joaquin Valley. Like we pick, you know, um, our parents were farm workers. So like, you know, we pick a lot of the fruit and uh, we just never really get to eat it because we can't afford it. Thank you for that, Leslie. Um, so I think, thanks everyone for your questions and comments and uh, chats. I hope, I hope you found this uh, conversation interactive. Um, so I think we'll just uh, start closing out if um, we want to do some closing remarks from the panelists and then we're going to um, end with some calls to action and resources for everyone on the call. Um, can we start with Rio? Thank you everybody for joining and, and your chats and to all the panelists, I've learned so much alongside you. So uh, that's been really wonderful. And again, just kind of leading off with the message that to really build out the world we, we want to see, we're going to have to really imagine that and allow ourselves to be uncensored. I think often, I know I even as an advocate have come into these spaces with politicians or transit agencies with a limited sense of where I can ask. Like, it feels like I'm asking for barely any concessions. And I think we can use this energy and this time to go all out and ask for what our communities have deserved and are long overdue. So that's just kind of like my last kind of uh, comments for everybody. And again, just with that message of like, to do that, we will have to emanate from a place of love. And love does to me mean not conceding to things that are oppressive, right? Like love actually means standing up for what's good and right. Um, so thank you all for joining. Thank you, Rio. Let's go to Denzel. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you again to everyone for joining and, and thank you to all the panelists. I also learned a lot today. 
Um, I, I would just say like the closing thoughts are that um, a lot of the issues that we see right now are just, you know, exas already pre-existing social and, and structural um, inequities that we have to work to address after COVID, like they're not going to disappear. Um, after COVID and, and especially from a public health standpoint, there are things that we need to continue to work on. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, I think I would just give another plug to please contact me or, or, or look into CIPC's work um, if anyone is interested in getting involved with the Health for All campaign or, or some of our other campaigns that sort of address some of these issues. And that's all. So thank you for having me. Thanks, Denzel. Hanna? Yeah, I'll just end with something that's um, been inspiring me is um, witnessing how some cities are using this opportunity to kind of recenter our cities around uh, pedestrians and bicyclists and away from cars. Um, and so just, yeah, that's giving me hope, seeing these bold and innovative ideas. Um, but we have to focus on how we can center equity in that. And I'll just end on, you know, these creative ideas aren't enough. This is a huge opportunity and really a necessity to hold policymakers, decision makers accountable to meeting their uh, big ideas and to specifically meeting the needs of marginalized populations. Thank you, Hannah. Vianney? Yeah, again, thank you, everyone. I also learned so much from the panelists, from the folks in the chat. Uh, really appreciate this opportunity to talk about what's going on in San Diego. Um, and again, kind of like um, Javier was saying, all of these calls to actions come from a place of love and light, right? And and again, um, standing up to oppressive policies is also comes from a place of love for our community. I uh, just want to say that there's a lot to learn from community members, from elders, and for people who populate these streets and these transit systems every day. Uh, so it's kind of important to keep an, keep an open mind and kind of hear what these community members need and what they're saying. Um, and yeah, just get involved in local community-based uh, organizations in your neighborhood. I think that's super important. Keep in touch with your decision makers because that's a great state step to make uh, changes like the ones we talked about today happen. So thank you. Thank you, Gane. Leslie? Yeah, um, I think I, I have a few. I think like my last my last couple points is, um, you know, we, the people, like, we are, we, we, uh, we own this whole system. Like, we are the ones that are part of it. We are in it. Um, and we, those of us that are on this webinar right now, whether as panelists or, like, listening in, like, the amount of privilege that we have to be listening to this webinar is, like, don't take it for granted. Like, make sure that you use the knowledge that you learn from everyone, um, to ensure the community that we're help, we're lifting communities up, we're lifting the needs up, and that they're at the front, that they're the that they are voicing their issues. Because just like you know, just said, like you cannot get, you cannot buy this type of expertise. You cannot buy this type of amazing community expertise. Um, it is earned, and uh, sometimes it's it, it's pain, it's like a painful thing that they that folks have earned. So let's let's do our let's hold our end of the bargain as advocates, as policymakers. Hold your electeds accountable. Use the, everything that you have um, disposable to you to make sure that we're lifting everyone up, including, and I'm going to do a little shameless plug for the rural and East Coachella Valley, because we could really use some help and, and partnering with all of us um, to really just take back our transportation back, you know? And thanks to everyone for coming. Thank you everyone for your comments, um, really echo what's been said um, and really appreciative of all the great knowledge um, and energy that, that we have here in this group. Um, so just wrapping up, just wanted to share some sort of action items that folks can take. Um, I'm not gonna read through them all, but you can take a look here um, and we will be sharing this along with um, some resources um, with the recording of the webinar so you can take action in your community locally um, at federal level and state level um, and just take a look at those resources, share them, share this webinar, um, connect um, to the folks on the panel. Um, you can also stay connected with us as a group um, and join the California California Mobility Justice Advocates Group. Um, if you email me, I'll be sure to add you to the list and you can stay up to date um, with what's happening with us and our, any convenings or, or policy platforms we're, we're working on. Um, next slide, please. And yeah, just again, resources, these will all be shared um, with the webinar recording. Last slide. 
So thanks everyone for uh, taking this time with us. Um, we really appreciate having you. Um, we hope you found it interactive um, and informative and we hope to stay in touch. And a round of applause for our panelists. We really appreciate you um, taking the time with us. Have a good afternoon, everyone.